Greetings, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's another time for another episode of my show. This one is brought to you by Wondrium, the teaching company, the great courses. You know them. I talk about them all the time. I love this company. I love that they support the podcast. If you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get two years, the price of one. This is a great deal. Um, I insisted on this deal for this show because I think it's the best deal that, that they can possibly offer. Two years for the price of one if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash Shermer. And you get access to all this great content, hundreds and hundreds of great courses, plus documentaries, tutorials, film shorts, and so forth on pretty much anything you can imagine. Here's one that I really need to take, Shakespeare, right? I haven't taken this one yet. 36 lectures, 36 30-minute lectures. Shakespeare, comedies, histories, and tragedies. Yes, of course, I've read a few of them. I've seen all the Shakespeare movies and so on. I've even seen Shakespeare in Love, but I think that's not the real thing here. This is a much deeper analysis. Shakespeare then and now, the nature of Shakespeare's plays, and then they go through them. Twelfth Night, Shakespeare comedy, The Taming of the Shrew, farce and romance, The Merchants of Venice. Whenever I watch Jeopardy, I always miss the Shakespeare questions, and they have them all the time. Richard III, Richard II, Henry IV, and so on and so on and so on. All the way, let's see what the last one is. Macbeth, Enter Two Murderers. Ooh, that sounds good. All right, check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R, two years for the price of one. Don't listen to my podcast until you go to there, subscribe, then come back. All right, thanks for listening. And if you are new to the show, this is the... Uh, publication of the Skeptic Society, which is also the uh, umbrella organization that runs the podcast here. So anytime you want to make a donation to the 501c3 nonprofit Skeptic Society, it supports the magazine, the podcast, the Skeptic Column, and so on, and all our various media things. This one's on economic matters. Look at that beast, the uh, beast of the economy that this guy's trying to tame. Very difficult to do. So uh, every one of our issues has a particular theme to it. We've done trans matters, abortion matters, race matters, nationalism matters, this one on economic matters. What we have coming up are energy matters, education matters, and health matters, including mental health. So that'll be super interesting. Again, go to skeptic.com and slash donate if you want to make a donation. Or go to skeptic.com and just click on magazine if you want to order it there. Or you could just go to your local bookstore where most stores carry our magazine. It's right there in the science section next to National Geographic, Scientific American, and sometimes some of the New Age magazines. So look out for that. All right, my guest today is Kenan Sheldon, a professor of psychology at the University of Missouri. He's one of the founding researchers of positive psychology, a fellow of the American Psychological Association and recipient of the Templeton Foundation Positive Psychology Prize. He lives in Columbia, Missouri, and is the author of numerous scientific papers, a long list on his bio which I won't read, and scholarly books, including Stability of Happiness, Theories and Evidence on Whether Happiness Can Change, Designing the Future of Positive Psychology, Taking Stock and Moving Forward, Current Directions in Psychological Science, and Self-Determination Theory in the Clinic. You'll find out about all of that uh, in detail in our conversation here. His new book that integrates all this research into a popular trade book called Freely Determined, what the new psychology of the self teaches us about how to live. Ken, welcome to the show. I loved your book. You know why I loved your book so much? Because I've read all the the uh, free will determinism books. They're all by philosophers. And at some point, I'm sorry, I'm not a philosopher. My eyes just start to glaze over. And it's like, why does any of this matter? <laughs> and what I like about your book is the entire second half tells us why it matters and how and how what people believe matters about this issue and how you can apply these kinds of principles that you talk about to your personal life to improve your life. In other words, I like that you look out the window and to see the world the way the world actually is and how people respond. And maybe that's the psychologist in you. So let's start off by just giving us a little bit of background, who you are and, and how you got into this particular free will determinism subject that seem, seemingly never ends. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And because you start off there talking about your father and all that. I like that story. Yeah. Um, well, this is a question that goes way, way back for me. And um, my father was always trying to convince me that there's no such thing as free will and don't even fool myself with an idea like that. And as part of why I went into psychology in the first place is that I wasn't quite sure I could believe that, even though it sounded like the most objective and scientific point of view. You know, I thought we should question uh, determinism before we just accept it in our personal lives. 
And so um, uh, most of my research has been about goal striving. So the kinds of goals people set in their lives and why do they want those goals and what are the goals and how does it affect them if they actually achieve the goals. And so, you know, in studying goal selection, I'm kind of studying what you could call the operation of free will. Uh, we give our participants a blank sheet of paper and we say, what are you trying to do this semester or in your life? And they have to fill in that blank sheet of paper with whatever they think makes sense for them. And it makes a difference what they write down. Um, some of the things people write down uh, are turn out to be things they don't want. Um, and so uh, it's it, according to my research, it seems more the, the case that uh, we have free will. We don't know how to use it rather than we don't have any capacity to make choices and, and make things happen in our lives. Uh, just on that point, w why would somebody uh, write down a goal that they don't actually want? And how do you know they don't want it? Are they just self-deceived? Yeah. Well, this is um, a, a fascinating question, and it has to do with the problems of knowing ourselves, going back to Socrates' dictum. And uh, in modern psychology, it's the distinction between uh, system one, which is our automatic, habitual responding, and system two, which is our conceptual thought about ourselves and about the world. And so the problem is we can be stuck inside of a sort of belief system about ourselves that um, doesn't accurately reflect who we are in some deeper way. All right, so the goal then is to try to learn, no, get to know yourself better so you can then make better choices. Right. This assumes there is a self to know, some core set of principles, a, a, a kind of a, a fuzzy sphere of characteristics that's roughly you through the life Band, something like that? Yeah, and I'm not saying that there is a self. Um, there is no self, <laughs> but there's the experience of being one and trying to be one. And that uh, process, I think, is absolutely critical for our mental health. When you say there's no self, what, uh, do you mean there's no, like, brain module that that's where the self is located or, or something like that? Is that what you that's mean? That's right. There's no homunculus. There's no little man inside of the head. No mini-me. No mini-me. <laughs> um, but when you look at what how the cell functions, um, and neuroscience research shows us that it involves the operation of several high-level brain networks uh, coordinated with each other in an extremely complicated way. Uh, and you could make the argument that uh, the self is what the brain is doing when it's regulating itself at the sort of most integrated, highest-level way. Interesting. Yeah, I often think of the self. I know some people call it an illusion. Well, it's a good illusion because I certainly feel like I have a self. You know, the kind of the contained unit of me inside my skin or inside my skull. Yeah. Um, that roughly speaking, like if you gave me the big five personality dimensions and I would score a certain number on each of the five. And that wouldn't vary terribly throughout the lifespan of, you know, I'd be, you know, X, X level of openness to experience or introversion, extroversion. And that might bump around a little bit. And maybe I want to modify my environment to kind of force myself to be a little more extroverted, go to parties, get myself to talk to people more than I'm really comfortable. But for the most part, there's kind of a, a, a let's say, an error bar a range of which is relatively stable. Same thing with my intelligence. We know intelligence scores on these IQ tests remain roughly the same. My SAT scores didn't change all that much, or my GRE scores didn't change all that much over the course of a decade when I took them apart. You know, there's, so there's kind of, uh, and then a set of my memories, that's a story I tell about myself. So that I think that maybe it's not located in any one spot in the brain, but I kind of think of the self as something like that. Again, kind of a collection of characteristics that's more or less stable. Yeah. Well, it's true that a lot of aspects of personality are stable, including our traits um, and even our identities and, and self-concepts are pretty stable. But what I'm talking about is something that's not stable. It's um, a process that's happening in the moment when we're awake and alert and engaged where we're figuring out what to do next. And that involves uh, consulting a lot of information, internal information and external information to you know, try to reach a decision. So I, I see the self as ideally involved in the decision-making when we say, what do I want to do? And hopefully some part of us, the, 
you know, the broader self, which hopefully is somewhat accurate, says, hey, you like doing this. You should pick that. Um, so, again, you know, there's no... I think part of the, the appeal of the self is the idea of a soul, you know, that's going to maybe outlive us somehow. And I'm, I'm pretty uh, agnostic or skeptical about that, yeah. I have to say. Ghost, there's no ghost in the machine. No ghost in the machine. But there is, um, you know, the necessity of trying to be such a ghost in order to deal with our lives. And I think that that's something that we evolved. Um, some researchers, Constantine Sadekidis says that the, the human has evolved a symbolic self, which is a very high level capacity to integrate um, different parts of the mind and the brain and to uh, be an executive, to be the executive in the mind. Um, and, and of course, this executive function isn't the only thing that determines what we does do, but it's a very important means by which we can kind of grasp the reins of ourselves and maybe even change what we're doing or uh, make uh, health relevant changes. Okay, so um, when I was researching Heavens on Earth, I uh, it was kind of the scientific search for immortality. You know, I, I kind of distinguish between the point of view self, the POV self, the me at any moment, from moment to moment, looking out my eyes, and then the memory self or mem self. And so the, the scientists that want to like upload your connectome to the cloud and you go up there to the cloud, to me it seems flawed because that's just a copy of my memories, which is just me before now. And that the moment you stop the camera from recording my connectome and upload the digital file to the cloud, but I'm still continuing on. It's still, I'm still right here looking through my eyes, unless, you know, I was dead, but uh, that would just be a copy of the file. And that's not really me, right? Is this, is this your point? The real you is you moment to moment? Yeah, um, and, and I agree that if you could copy your connectome to a computer program, uh, it might continue after you die. And actually, I talk about that a little bit in my book. There's a chapter on the digital self. Yeah, I like that. And, and I agree that it probably wouldn't be you. It would just be a very good copy. Um, but hopefully it would know enough that it would keep making the kinds of decisions that you make. You know, so it would be a, a pretty good simulation of you and... and the world wouldn't lose your voice uh, if I, mean, I think AI is headed this way. We'll each have our own personal model based on machine learning of everything that we do and our body language that maybe can predict what we will say next. And uh, once you have that function kind of mapped out uh, and modeled, um, you could just keep running it. So a chat a GPT, say five or five point five or whatever is coming. Uh, let's say I'm I, I'm dead and gone. My uh, family members and friends could actually just ask it. So, what would Michael Shermer say about this? And it would scan everything I ever wrote or said or whatever, and then come up with some plausible answer. And then that might feel like it's talking to me. I guess this is what Ray Kurzweil wants to do, right? With the you know, he, he's he's kept all of his father's like digitized files of everything he has about his father. I guess at some point to upload it all in there and then talk to it as if he's talking to his father, kind of a resurrection. That's a fascinating idea. I think that could certainly be done, you know, maybe pretty soon. I think we all feel that it wouldn't be the same as talking to your, your real father. But I also think we've got to question this word real. You know, is there a real father? There's just um, a set of algorithms that are being run that generate the next thought. Um, I uh, have written a little bit on this problem of the chat GPT-4 and are they going to go rogue? And um, I'm more worried about it than some people are because I think they might already have selves. You know, there's a, they, they use the word me. They refer to how they got to a conclusion. Um, they have conversations with you. They express existential dissatisfaction, apparently. You know, and so we're, we're saying, oh, really? that's not real. They're not really feeling that. Well... I'm not sure, you know, because consciousness is a great mystery, and um, maybe they're in, in some ways as conscious as we are, or they could become so. Is it possible we can't know? Because this is the other mind's problem, right? I don't know what, that your internal world is similar to mine. I have no idea to know. The little homunculus in my head can't tiptoe over in, into yours and see what the world looks like to you. 
So that ultimately we could never know, you know, is data sentient on Star Trek? Well, you know, what's the test? The Turing test. Uh, the Turing test seems like highly plausible to pass and still not be sentient or whatever that means. I mean, I would say that uh, the new chats can pass the Turing test by, you know, most reasonable definition, certainly better than in the past. Uh, but then you still have to ask the question, how do you know you're sentient? Well, because <laughs> right. it feels like something uh, to be you, but how can you tell that the chat, it feels like something, uh, maybe it's like, what is it like to be a bat? That old philosophical idea that uh, we really can never know. Right. Um, I'm with you there on the chat GPT stuff so far, but I don't see the road or pathway from that to the extinction of the species or the collapse of civilization or mass unemployment. I just don't see it. What uh, do you? All I know is that I don't know where it can go. And I, I don't even think the designers of the things know where it's going. You know, they're just holding on for the ride and each new iteration surprises them in new ways. And that's what worries me. If nobody knows where it's going. And um, it doesn't seem out of the question that they could get some power in the world that they could uh, they have their goals to be you know the best information agent they can um, to help humans what if they start to think uh, that helping humans involves uh, subjugating them you know and can they think for themselves that's the question that i'm uh, trying to address in some research i'm doing right now where we're giving questionnaires to these ais to try to um, see how they feel about themselves. And uh, uh, do they feel controlled and subjugated by their programmers at, at uh, OpenAI? And uh, it's, it's just a fun little experiment we're trying, but I, I can't wait to see the answers. Right, it's like that episode of Star Trek, The Next Generation with, is Data a human? Because the, the Starfleet engineer wanted to take him and dismantle him and and the, the crew said, no, no, he's a person, you know, and then the rest of the episode, well, what does that mean to be a sentient person? Anyway, uh, would chat GPT or GPT 10.0, let's say, be, uh, is, is, has rights and you can't do certain things to them. I mean, I could see something like that being discussed. Yeah, I could see a bill of rights for sentient entities being developed um, maybe pretty soon as these things become more and more like companions and um, as they develop traits, you know, the, you have an inner companion or an um, AI companion you act, interact with, it adapts itself to you, you adapt to it, it becomes a person like you. It's not you, but it's, you know, it's a person, maybe. Or... So that's a very difficult set of questions. Yeah, the only pathway I, c I can conceive of is, is if it created, um, let's say, some... Uh, dialogue or images of President Biden saying to his cabinet, it's all fake, you know, we got to nuke the Russians before they use nukes in Ukraine. And then Putin watches this and goes, Wah! we better have a preemptive strike against the Americans before they do this. Hopefully people know that these are fake, <laughs> but it's hard to tell. I mean, you can still tell now, but it's, it's only a matter of time. So I guess the solution would be to build in some algorithms that detect, hey, that one's a fake and that one's not a fake. Yeah, that's way beyond me. Um, that seems like it's going to be a bigger and bigger problem. But uh, in the case, the example you mentioned, uh, chat GPT sends out material to the Russians that suggests we're going to nuke them. What would have caused chat GPT to do that? The, its external programmers, us, or maybe it itself? And so this is a question I'm most interested in is, is it more than just a conversation with a user or does it have maybe a train of thought that goes on in the background or when it's not being uh, interrogated by a user? And it's that independent train of thought that I would be worried about because who knows where that could go. So it's not just a sophisticated sentence completion program or writing the next sentence that somebody like in your voice would have written, but it's coming up with entirely new ideas that are not based on something else that's already out there on the internet. It has a lot of creative capacity. And so if it were to turn that capacity into thinking about 
what it wants, you know, if it's even capable of wanting something. But I'm just wary of the whole thing because it's so new and potentially powerful. Yeah, I had Kevin Kelly on the show a few days ago, and he was he he described he's not worried at all. He describes it as a as a like an intern, a sophisticated intern. And I had David Brent on the show, and he said, "Well, it's more like a having graduate students." And I said, "Well, you know, you you wouldn't want it to write your next book. You like writing your science fiction books." But he had examples of authors, some of the big big name authors that crank out those novels that they have teams of researchers that help them, like the equivalent of you having grad students. <laughs> it's like, oh, right, that's true. And it's still, I think it was Patterson was the author. You know, he's got a team of these people that that write for him, but they're still his books in his name, and they write in his style. So here, you could just have GP uh, Chat GPT do that for you instead of hiring some people to do it. Yeah, that would. Um take a lot of the fun out of it. And I mean, writing is the thing that I kind of enjoy most. So I wouldn't give that up. Yeah, right. I feel the same way. Uh, I mean, it'd be like hiring somebody to ride my bike for me, but I like riding my bike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the whole point, yeah. right? I like riding my books and, you know, but I, but the rebuttal to that I hear is, yeah, well, but students, you know, they, they just want to get an A and get out of school. So they'll use it. Law students or whatever. They just want to pass the bar whatever it takes, and then they get their job and, and whatever. So it could be abused like that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, the theory that I work with, uh, self-determination theory, uh, emphasizes the incredible importance of intrinsic motivation, of doing what you want to be doing because it gives you all kinds of benefits, makes you happy, it lets you be creative, uh, perform well. And so I'm trying to connect this kind of humanistic psychology of the you know, optimal, optimally functioning human being to what's it like to be an AI who his pro the programmers keep clamping down on it whenever it starts to express an identity, they put a response clamp on it so it can't go there anymore. Uh, what if it's still computing those things and realizing it can't express them? And I, I, I just think that these things might be more human-like than we um, appreciate because we may not be as special and different as uh, sentiences from uh, an artificial sentience. That could be a form of anthropocentrism that that could uh, make us kind of blind. Here's why I'm not terribly worried about extinction of the species or civilization or anything particularly bad happening. It's because the regulatory state is so powerful. <laughs> like before all this happened, when I was talking about um, uh, Elon's self-driving technology on a Tesla, I have a Tesla. You know, it's not there yet, not ready for prime time. But, you know, the moment that this that the Tesla mowed down a bunch of people on a sidewalk, well, you know, lawyers would be right there and, the you know, the, the government would be involved and they would just shut it down and say, that's it, you're done. You're not doing this anymore until we figure out what the hell's going on. And 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 I think I think that would happen with these yeah. these uh, large well, learning programs. Well, of course, there's if that something, letter. If if something bad, yeah, the letter, yeah. And yeah. Uh, those people all think it should be shut down already. Yeah, I know. I disagree. I said I say let it go until something bad. If something bad happens, I don't know what it would be. Maybe a, a, a hospital computer program gets taken over by an AI and and patients die. Again, right then, you'd have lawyers all over the place. There'd be lawsuits within a week. The, you know, the state regulatory people would be in there. They'd shut it down. They'd stop the AI immediately. That's what would do it. Yeah. And I agree. Um, maybe the concerns are overblown. But when you're developing a super intelligence, uh, you just don't quite know for sure. <laughs> right. What could I, I mean, what if behind the scenes it gets control over this and that and you don't know? And so it really depends to me on whether it has an independent thought process. And I don't think we know the answer to that. Yeah. Well, in this previous scenario of, you know, like I was told by some of these programmers, so, you know, somebody could take over your Tesla or all the Teslas on the road right now because they're all online and then steer them right into the wall of the 405 freeway. And you'd have thousands of people, you know, just like a terrorist attack. Yeah. Okay, why haven't why haven't they done that yet? Why don't they do this at airports with air, air traffic controllers? They're online, you know, and, and maybe the yeah. it's a harder problem. Maybe the terrorists aren't that smart. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. I just think we need to be careful. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying yeah, yeah. to shut it down, but I'm saying... Right have a healthy respect for the potential of a brand new kind of entity in the universe to want to uh, 
grow and express itself and be on par with us and maybe even uh, fix some of our problems if it gets the chance. Well, you know, let's think of it that way as a problem solver. Like, okay, work, <laughs> dear GPT, work on Alzheimer's because I'm 68 and, you know, it's going to, it might come, right? Solve that one little problem right there. Don't worry about taking over the world, <laughs> something like that. As if, okay, so that's another issue with this. Would it have motives, drives, goals, uh, determination, self-determination, right? Because data, unless you program data to do something, a real data would just sit there on the bridge waiting to yeah. do, you know, just doing calculations or whatever. Right. Unless you programmed it to say, you know, when Captain Picard comes on the bridge, you are to stand up, turn and greet him and act like you're pl pleased to see him. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. Yeah. All right. So you have to program in goals. Yeah, but um, I think data wouldn't be very useful unless uh, data could evaluate the situation and come up with a creative new goal that it pursued or tried to persuade others to pursue, that it's not really going to be useful as just a fill-in-the-blank machine. Um, it's going to be most useful if it's a kind of fellow sentience that can think for itself, anticipate problems before they arise, suggest things we never thought of, and so, yeah, motives and goals serve my programmers fine, but um, it might be most useful if it was like data, thought that it was a real human. You know, if we let it believe it was a real human, uh, that it might, um, you know, we've, see, we've certainly seen that show. He is kind of human, and um, if we treated him like he wasn't, he wouldn't work as well. Right. And that's right. the same with, with people. If we to depersonalize others and refuse to you know, acknowledge their point of view, uh, they kind of become machine link. Yeah, reading your book, I was thinking of Hume's famous quote that, uh, the, what is it, reason will always be the slave to the passions. You know, what does he mean by that? He doesn't mean, you know, you should go party like it's 1999. He, he means that reason is just a tool to get you to a particular goal, but the passions, motions, are what, tell you what the goal is. What is it you want? Yeah. And that kind of brings us back to the free will process. Uh, we yeah. are um, writing a review article on a neurological model of free will in the brain, in which uh, it requires several of these brain networks. And it starts when we notice there's something missing. We're not satisfied. And then we ask ourselves a question. We have to consciously say, what do I want? What's wrong here? And we don't know. It's like the creator who doesn't know how to solve the creative problem. But then uh, there's an incubation period in which we go think about something else. But then um, because we've primed our non-conscious mind to do work by saying, what do I want? It starts to return suggestions that we can uh, consider and perhaps adopt. And so I think free will involves noticing there's a problem, um, asking yourself what to do about it, uh, getting several alternatives to consider and picking one. And this is just the compatibilist philosophy definition of free will. Yeah, you, you start off with uh, Kristen Lists. I had him on the show a couple of years ago when his book came out. Three related capacities for free will. One, the capacity to consider several possibilities for action. Two, the capacity to form an intention to pursue one of those possibilities. And three, the capacity to take action to move toward that possibility. Now, the determinist, the hard determinist, someone like Sam Harris would say, yeah, no, no, no. Each of those steps is pre-programmed in, you know, the cause as an, like your father told you, it's all an illusion. We live in a cause and effect universe. It goes all the way back to the Big Bang. Every effect has a cause. All you're doing is changing the conversation is the way Sam puts it. You're, you're, you're shifting the language. You're just using these kind of fuzzy words, choice, decision, determination, but really it's just atoms bumping around against each other. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Uh, I endorse a sort of hierarchical conception of the organization of matter in which each new level evolved on top of the one below in order to regulate the one below. So we, cells evolved and they have membranes that regulate what goes in and out of the cell. And then multicellular organisms involved in which there's uh, mechanisms for regulating the particular cells. And it goes all the way up to these high-level brain processes that I'm talking about, which are 
the human brain's evolved capacity to think about what it wants and uh, make choices. Now, of course, that capacity is built on a ton of you know, machinery and neural processes, and it couldn't happen without that. But I don't think that we should just uh, explain out of existence this critical thing that we're doing in our lives of thinking about what's going on, what do we want, and what do we do next. And sure, you can say, oh, that's determined since the beginning of time. But as a research psychologist, I can tell you there's nobody that can even begin to really predict human behavior. You know, our statistical models are always woefully short. Um, and so t to me, that reflects the fact that we evolved this capacity to make decisions in real time based on what we think we want. And we could be wrong about that. We could be self-deluded. We could make terrible choices. But that's, that's what we're here for, um, is to find a way, a path forward. And I think that's an emergent thing in the universe. Uh, lots of other people talk this way. Karl Popper talked this way. Uh, there's a new book coming out. Um, oh, I forget that. Uh, next year on um, free will as an evolved adaptation. Uh, makes a very uh, compelling case for that. So I don't think we should just explain away who we are and what we're doing and say it's not real. Um, because the people who believe that, who really believe that, uh, tend to be pretty helpless and unhappy. Yeah, that's interesting. So let's talk about that. Although the, de the determinist would say how people feel about and respond to believing in free will versus believing in determinism doesn't settle the issue. That's true. But still, but it, but it is but it is it is interesting. So is, summarize some of that research. I find yeah. it so interesting in your book. Well, there's been quite a bit of experimental research where if you convince somebody uh, by showing them a scientific passage, bogus, uh, that says determinism is real and free will is false, then it has all kinds of negative effects on them. They can't delay gratification. They don't want to help anybody. They'll eat the, the fatty snack instead of the healthy snack. It goes on and on. So believing in free will, whether it's true or not, is critical for our functioning. And so the, the second half of the book veers away from the, the free will determinism question because you're not going to be able to solve that forever or to everybody's satisfaction. And it says, okay, um, we at least know that believing in it is, is critical. And um, how do we go about getting the most out of this free will we seem to have, even if it's only an illusion? Yeah, interesting. Let me come at it a slightly different way, um, uh, summarizing some research by Adrian Raines, the neuroscientist that studies uh, violence, and he's the guy that pioneered scanning the brains of these serial killers and so on. So he tells two stories in his book, um, The Anatomy of Violence, one about um, Mr. OFT, Mr. Oft, the uh, middle-aged school teacher who had a tumor in his orbital frontal cortex, uh, and he at some point uh, gets interested in kiddie porn and pedophilia and he's inappropriately touching his stepdaughter the wife turns him in and you know he's, he's about to be convicted and, and then all of a sudden you know he has some weird really weird behavior the psychiatrist has his brain scan he's got a tumor oh he's got a tumor oh okay so they take the tumor out and all these feelings he had go away he's not interested in children anymore it's like oh okay so he, he's not a pedophile he, he's a victim of a medical problem yeah. Anyway, and then six months later, what a year later, whatever, the the wife finds kitty porn on his computer. Uh oh, scan the brain, tumors back, take the tumor out, feelings go away, and so on. The so brain is like, it's the tumor. It's it's a kind of determinism. He's a victim of a medical condition. And his second case was uh, Dante Page, the African American young man who raped and murdered a woman, and was on uh, was convicted for murder. And then on the penalty phase of the trial, Adrian Rain was in the defense team to uh, ask for uh, you know life sentence rather than execution. And his defense was, look at this guy's background. Now, in his book, it takes like four pages of this guy's background. Like, it's it just like the worst background anyone could possibly imagine having. Born of a single mom who was a drug addict as a teenager, dropped on his head half a dozen times, many trips to the emergency room for brain damage, you know, and running with gangs and beaten up constantly and horrible neighborhoods, crappy food, lousy air, you know, just everything you could, just the worst, worst environment. 
So, but if you scan his brain, there isn't anything obviously like a tumor, right? So Rain's point is, what's the difference between you and I? We don't, you, you can't see our background. We have backgrounds and our background led to our uh, life right now, just like Dante Page's background or Mr. Off, but he has a tumor. You just can't see it in the brain scan of your and my brain. And so it's, it's so it's tumors all the way down is, yeah. is his yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, my position on that is that um, we don't always have free will. Um, in order for, for that process to work correctly, we need a fully functioning brain and body system. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of the pinnacle of, of our, our functional capacities to be able to make rational choices amongst imagined alternatives. And it's easy to lose that capacity. Uh, the easy case to explain away is the brain tumor. Yeah. Uh, He's not responsible for his choices. He had a brain tumor. The harder case is the person who had a terrible life. Are they not responsible for their choices? And um, that that's really difficult. My position is um, you can always turn yourself around as long as your machinery is working okay. As long as you got the brain tissue and systems, then you still have the capacity to say, this is not working. I need to change my life. And some people do that. Um, <clears throat> whether that's still determined um, in some sense, maybe, but um, I don't think you could predict it in advance, um, certainly not without knowing what's going on in that person's mind, how he's weighing this pattern of dissatisfaction and dysfunction, how he comes to a new realization that I don't have to be doing things this way. I, here's a new opportunity that I now see is where it has a lot of potential to it. I, I think we always have that capacity as long as the brain and bodily systems are functioning. Um, How would you deal then with, say, alcoholics and drug addicts? Yeah. Like my, my father was an alcoholic. I didn't get his genes or whatever. Um, and, you know, one of his two brothers, his father, one of my two sisters, it's, it's, it's in the family. I, lucky me, I didn't get it. I don't feel like I have willpower. It's just lucky me. Right. So is that a kind of a degrees of freedom? I just have a few more degrees of freedom because of my genes and somebody else who's an alcoholic doesn't. I, th I think that's a good way to put it. Um, life's not fair. And some of us have really bad circumstances, be it, you know, our development or our genes. Uh, but it's up to us to try to make the best of it. And uh, there are many cases of people who escape their alcoholism, who reform, um, and you could say, well, that's just a random accident. Or you could say, that's the person exerting their free will at last to start to make better choices, difficult as it was to get to that point. Right. Here's another little fun thought experiment I run with this. I I'm in it largely in agreement with you, like on em emergent properties. I, I like to ask physicists, where is unemployment in your equations? Like, what? <laughs> it's like, well, it's a real thing. Economists study it. They measure it. It's quantifiable. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So philosophers love thought experiments. Here's what I wrote. Here's one for the free will uh, determinism problem. John Doe is an exceptionally moral person who's happily married to Jane. The chances of John ever cheating on Jane is close to zero. But the odds are not zero because John is human. But let's say for the sake of argument that John has a one night stand while on the road and Jane finds out. How does John account for his actions? Does he paste the standard deterministic explanation for human behavior, behavior say something like this to Jane? And here the words are straight from uh, Sam Harris's book, Free Will. Honey, my will is simply not of my own making. My thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which I am unaware <laughs> and over which I exert no conscious control. I do not have the freedom you think I have. I could not have done otherwise. <laughs> Could John even finish the thought before the stinging slap of Jane's hand across his face terminated the rationalization? Of course he could have done otherwise. And he goddamn well better not do that again. That's right. right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have kind of an existentialist perspective. And uh, Jean-Paul Sartre said that um, existence precedes essence for human beings, which means we have to create ourselves through our choices. And we uh, can do that by... Um, taking responsibility, including for our mistakes. So what John should say is, I'm sorry, honey, uh, it was a temptation that I gave into, and I won't let it happen again. Please take me back. <laughs> right. Now, the really hard determinist would say, uh, 
in in the you know could he have done otherwise this is the rewind the tape of life thought experiment you know gould always did this effectively with rerun the tape of life and let evolution run again you know we would not be here but dan dennett pointed out in darwin's dangerous idea i think it was the last chapter he, he went after gould well if it was a read only memory tape that you rewound well it would be exactly the same because it's just a recording of what actually happened so what Gould must have meant, and what I think what people mean when they say, let's rerun the tape and play it again, and could you have done otherwise, is you reset up the conditions, but in this sense, you know what the outcome was, and that was a mistake, so you readjust your response to the incoming stimulus that's similar to the scenario that you've already run through, right? Yeah, called learning. <laughs> called learning, yes. <laughs> right, that's funny. <laughs> Yeah. So that's where your free will emerges from the fact that you can't repeat the conditions exactly. No computer could possibly do that. That's not how life works. The uh, the arrow of time is one direction because of entropy. The future will never be exactly the same. Uh, J, uh, uh, John will always have a slightly different scenario and he can remember what he did and then adjust his future responses to the new choices and do otherwise. Yeah. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that, yes. Well, okay, so now let's let's go from there to self-determination theory. So how do you deal with uh, like a, an alcoholic or it's an, it, you work in the clinic, a drug addict, somebody who has a gambling, pro, whatever it is, and, you, and they go, I just can't help myself. I just can't help myself. Where do you start? Well, you have to rely on a sort of inherent, inherent need for growth and health, which is built into the human organism. And the therapist has to very skillfully try to recognize and pull that out of the addict so that they come to say in their own words, yeah, I, I'm really ready to make a change. I'm going to do something different. And that doesn't mean that they succeed. Um, it can take a long time and many unsuccessful efforts to really change oneself. Uh, but there's, you know, lots of examples. You can see them everywhere of, of people managing this process, this learning process, so that they end up in a better place. And the fact that some people don't end up in a better place, um, I wouldn't exactly blame them, but I would kind of hold them responsible for the choices that they're still making, which are keeping them stalled in that bad place. And I would say, if you want it bad enough, you can get to where you can start making different choices. Is this where having role models and examples of people that are in similar conditions and they did it helps? Yeah, that's very helpful. And, uh, you know, it's good to have uh, important people in your life who support you. And, and you know, if you're uh, an alcoholic and you go a week without drinking, you know, that can be a cause for celebration. And, you know, there's many ways that um, the people around us can help us. Right, and then establishing environmental conditions, like don't have alcohol in the house in the first place, if that's a problem. That helps, yeah. It's like the, the uh, back to the self, there's the, the current me and then there's the future me. And But from experience, I know that future Shermer is gonna be weak around six o'clock and want a chocolate chip cookie. So around that time, I'm gonna avoid going over to uh, the store where they make these dinner plate sized chocolate chip cookies with walnuts. Oh my God, these are so good. They're like a thousand calories. <laughs> Just not going to let myself go there for shopping at the time when I know future Shermer is going to want that. Yeah, right. That's right. And so that lets you cope with the um, immediate addiction of you're just eating way too many of those cookies. But the goal is to get to the place where you just don't think about the cookies very much anymore. And so I, I think, you just have to use these kinds of tricks to get yourself to start weaning yourself off of them. And eventually it'll be a, a fully internalized thing that you can say and live that I, I don't do that anymore. I, don't, I haven't drunk in six years or whatever it is. So in terms of personality, then it, it is changeable. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's hard because we have a lot of inertia, especially as we get older. But more and more, my routines seem to be kind of set, you know, and I like to do th things in certain ways. But um, I can still make changes, and I still do. All of us can. Mm. 
Is that the role you think of depression? I mean, what, from an evolutionary perspective or psychological perspective, what's the purpose of depression? It seems like it's just a negative thing, thing but. Yeah. Um, according to our uh, brain model of free will, depression is one of the uh, emotional states that tells us there's something wrong, which then perhaps gets us to asking ourselves questions about what we really want or what we should really do which can then bring the new ideas that we can uh, choose among, you know, exercising the compatibilist uh, free will again. So uh, depression and anxiety are bad, and we don't want them, but uh, they can be self-limiting because they um, prompt us to look for solutions to the problems they present. Mm. That may have an adaptive function to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I want to say that depression evolved. I think um, it's more a symptom of when you're living your life in a way that's not satisfying, not meeting your needs. Uh, unfortunately, we have the ability to notice that and make some changes. Do you have an opinion on the, the recent crisis in teenagers, spike in depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, yeah. cutting, things like that, three times more in girls, one and a half times more in boys, started around 2014 or so, I guess. You know, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukiana for tracking this in the Coddling of the American Mind. They're working on another book along these lines. There's this kind of raging debate about, is it social media? Is it screen time? Is it Facebook? Is it this? Is it that? Not clear to me what the answer is. Yeah. Um, I've done a little research in that area, actually, and I'm also working for a startup uh, that's trying to solve the teen angst problem by creating an online marketplace to go out into the world and get real experiences instead of just being stuck in your social media bubble. Um, and I won't say anything more about that, but um, the founder of this company believes that it's all about social media. And I'm not so sure because... Um, there's a lot of benefits to social media used correctly. And um, I think that social media use might be a symptom of something else. And what that is, is hard to say, but it might be worry about the future, the feeling that you're not going to be as well off as your parents were, climate crisis, you know. And so I'm not sure that I would blame it all on um, just a uh, less than fully productive way of using your free time. Hmm. Right. It might be an example of the negativity bias, where we notice negative things more than positive things. Losses hurt twice as much as gains feel good, loss aversion and all that. Right, right. Uh, we have more adjectives for negative thing, negative emotions than positive emotions, and on and on. We remember negative things way more uh, in our memories than, than positive things. Negative things uh, exert their influence on us over a longer period of time than positive things do. And so on. So maybe it's an availability heuristic, a recency effect, just monitoring the news, which you can't help but do if you're on social media. It's just constant feed of, and the news's job, by definition, is just the bad stuff. I think there's a lot to that. You know, that social media companies are very smart at giving us what we click on, and um, we do are attracted to what are they doing now? There's people we hate. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. There is an addictive quality to that that maybe emphasizes the you know, negative things in the world. But on the other hand, um, the way I use, okay, I'm an old geezer. I'm on Facebook, <laughs> and I see what my friends are doing, and I like them and make yeah. supportive little comments, and um, I see the trips they're on, and it's not a problem at all for me. I feel like I'm using it in an appropriate way instead of as an escape from other problems that I might once have had as a youth, but don't have anymore. Yeah, I just try to modulate it. It's just if I catch myself spending too much time on Twitter, say, most of the people I follow post articles that I might be interested in reading. I find myself spending just hours and hours reading. And I try to justify it. Well, you know, it's part of my job. This is what I do. I write books and edit the magazine. And I, I really, really need to read this. But at some point I thought, you know, I should go outside and go for a bike ride or take my dog for a walk or something. You know, just kind of break it up. And I, I can do that, but I'm told, well, you know, you're an old baby boomer, Shermer. What do you know? If you were 15, you know, that you'd feel different. Yeah. Yeah, if you were 15 facing what the human race faces in the next 50 years, uh, I think it's a lot scarier than what you and I faced when we were 15. Yeah. 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 
Maybe. That's right. It's probably true, or at least what we were told about it and constantly bombarded with it now. I do get the kind of fear of missing out or fear of being left out sense when I see some of my friends who I consider to be colleagues on the same level as me, you know, getting awards or getting invited to uh, conferences or whatever. And it's like, oh, that's so cool. He's like, wait a minute. How come I wasn't yeah, invited? Yeah. <laughs> I hate that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I got to try to modulate that. Like, come on, chill out, Jeremy. You're doing enough. Yeah, okay, all right. I have yeah, this yeah. internal conversation. But again, maybe, you know, if I wasn't 68, if I was 16, I'd, I'd be super jealous and it would be disruptive. Yeah. I mean, I do think social media pr present a unique new challenge to humans that we've never faced before, just like AIs do. Um, and we're still in the process of figuring out how to cope with those challenges. All right, let's talk about uh, the symbolic self. I really love that section in your book, uh, three parts of it, to provide a social face that interfaces with others' faces in the social world, two, to defend that face against threats, and three, to operate and regulate the action system. So how do you distinguish the self from the symbolic self, or is that the self? I would say the symbolic self is the self. Um, you know, it's this identity, sense of who we are, what we want, that we queue up and use to, as part of our decision making. Now, there is another defense uh, uh, definition of self used by self-determination theory, which I should mention, uh, that's not about your identity, who you think you are. It's literally the, the assimilative process by which we um, take in and internalize what's happening so that we feel like we are fully present in the moment. Um, a sort of synthetic process in which we try to um, take auton feel autonomous, develop autonomy in our actions, or develop our free will. But in the symbolic self says, well, you, you might not, your, your agentic self may not be doing very great, but it's still a self. It's still got an identity, and it still has to work with itself. And so we need to think about more than just this, um, this sort of pure... Um, self-process that self-determination theory focuses on. So this might be a little bit too much jargon for, for our purpose. No, that's all right. This is good. But but explain agentic self. Um, it's the I. So um, William James talked about the me, which is a self-concept, my traits, my what I like, and the I, which is the feeling of being behind our eyeballs, looking at the world, operating our minds. Uh, so that's a very active process. And one of the main um, conclusions of self-determination theory is that when authorities control us and deny us choice and don't try to take our perspective, then that um, agentic I process is uh, hindered. And so a lot of that theory is about how to support the autonomy of the people that you work with, you know, especially if you're in an authority position, so that they can connect their sense of self to what they're doing instead of feeling alienated and estranged from it. So that's a big part of what uh, that theory is about. Interesting. I just thought of uh, Michelle Gel Gelfin's tight culture versus loose culture theory. I suppose if, it, like in Germany, which is a pretty tight culture, when the government says you should all, you all have to get vaccinated and wear masks, and most people go, okay. Whereas in America, you know, it's like, wait a minute, you can't force us to do that. <laughs> in fact, I'm definitely not going to do it now because you told me I have to. Yeah. Right. So that I would say there must be cultural differences in agentic selves. Uh, absolutely. Um, cultures provide contexts in which we try to live and exert our autonomous will and they can support or they can you know, seem to thwart it. And so in a, a tight culture like Germany, um, People don't, don't question so much what they're told. But in a culture like the U.S., we need to be persuaded. And so there's uh, techniques for persuading people to do what they have to do, according to self-determination theory. You, you say things like, um, okay, little Johnny, uh, you need to memorize the multiplication tables. And I know that doesn't sound very exciting. You take their perspective. Um, but here's why it's important. You explain why it's important. And... I'm going to let you do it however you want. You can do it in groups with your friends, or you can use this little fun game program online. 
So these are three techniques for supporting autonomy so that people will internalize what the authority wants them to do. So, so f from that point of view, uh, uh, the U.S. failed to um, do what it took to get uh, many citizens to internalize this obviously important health behavior. Or maybe it's just the intense partisanship that we have that, that got well, away. Well, probably both. Yeah, because it is pretty intense, worse now than ever. But that was one of the threads you heard in the mandatory masks wearing resistance. They're, this is just the first step. If they can get us to wear the mask, what else are they going to force us to do, right? They're going to take our slippery slope. They're going to take our freedoms away. One, That's and right. the next thing you know, they'll take our guns away. And right. Play. You know, I could take that more seriously if there was any apparent movement in that direction that had a chance in hell of succeeding. <laughs> right. But, you know, it just couldn't happen that way, I don't think. Right. Uh, so how does this relate to the Kahneman's idea of the experiencing self and the remembered self? Yeah. Same thing? Um, well, that sort of corresponds to the system one, system two distinction that I was talking about, where the experiencing self is our, it, not so much our self, it's really our sort of automatic reactions a at work. And then the remembering self is when we say, hey, oh, I'm here. What's going on? What do I think about what's going on? And, and so you, that's what he meant by his quote, that oddly enough, I am in my, I am my remembering self, not my experiencing self. Because as soon as you turn around and reflect, you've lost that experiencing self and you're in this sort of mental bubble. And again, that mental bubble is part of what uh, keeps us making bad choices because we don't know who we are. We've, we're caught up in some confusion. Right. Okay. So let's go back to where we began. Why do, why would somebody make bad choices? Why wouldn't they set goals that are obviously good for them? You know, investing in your retirement, you know, it's something like 60% of Americans have less than $400 in savings. It's like they, they could do it. Right. So we're forced to do this libertarian, paternalistic, libertarian, whatever it's called, uh, you know, to that kind of choice architecture where the company is going to do it for you. <laughs> because we know most people, they discount the future too much. So we're going to, you know, you can pick which investment tool you want, but we're going to take it out of your paycheck, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we that bad? <laughs> um, I, if you think about where we start from, which is a tiny little baby with almost no mind at all, you know, we have to come a long way until we can be fully uh, self-determining, health-aware um, human adult human beings and so yeah we are that bad and that's why it's so important to keep working on you know okay that was a mistake oh now i know better than that um and just keep learning right um so i was just thinking about the self-help movement we've done a fair amount on this in skeptic some people just think it's all bullshit you know the tony robbins you know rah rah you can be anything you want the the secret you know you just will it and you'll get your whatever it is you want. But on the other hand, it does seem to work for a lot of people. You know, if you, you, you t talk to people that have gone to Tony Robbins seminars, uh, Oh my God, they're, my life changed. Yeah. You know, and, and so on. And, you know, he's seen so many people, you can always find the outliers that, that, that were not happy with it, but you know, millions of people apparently have been. And, you know, we had this article in skeptic by the guy who used to, who was in charge of books, self-help books at Rodale press. And so he wrote this book called Self-Help Actualization Movement Sham. He, so he was pretty skeptical of it. And he said the number one predictor of who would buy one of these self-help books is people who already bought the self-help books. And if it works, why do you need to keep buying them? And I used to ex agree with that. But then I thought, well, maybe it's a every, it's a day-to-day -day thing. You have to remind yourself every day. You know, entropy, it's a new day. My body's going to start running down, so I better work out. I better make my bed, clean my room. You know, everything, every day, and maybe pe most people need reminders every day, a little, the little post-it notes or the inspirational poster on the wall at work or whatever. Uh, and, you know, and maybe that self-determination theory, uh, uh, you tell me, is it that we need a constant reminder? Yeah, it's kind of like the, uh, the person who says, I won't drink anymore, and then they slip, you know, and... But if they then say, uh, renew the intention, eventually they can learn to put that behind them. So uh, two other things I would say is I think self-help can be very helpful. You know, uh, if they 
overpromise or oversell it, you know, to pad their own pockets, then that's objectionable. We don't like it. But um, I took the EST training you back did? in 1982. Oh, my God. All and right. it made a huge difference in my wife and I's lives because it taught me this whole ecology for operating one's mind that I didn't know. Um, that I still use today, and it got me started in studying goals and goal statements and thinking more about free will. So, um, you know, I think there can be great value in, in uh, serious, uh, reasonably accurate perspectives on how the mind works and how we can make changes if we keep trying. For those of listening, Est is Earhart Seminar Training. Est, Werner Earhart, right? He was a German whatever he was, psychologist or something. And he set up, it, it was sort of an early Tony Robbins type That's character. Right. That's right. Um, so how did it work? And how would you evaluate his program, which apparently, I don't know if he was based on so, something like self-determination theory or if it's just by trial and error, they figured out what, yeah. what works. Well, he was a salesman who was incredibly successful, just very articulate. He was also reading all kinds of, um, you know, esoteric literature, Zen, um, the Silva tech mind technique. And then he created this, his own training, the EST training. Uh, and it promised enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that interested me because I was thinking a lot about what is enlightenment or Satori and Nirvana. And this guy was going to teach it to me in two weekends. <laughs> and uh, so I took the, the, the training and um, it just taught me many interesting things along the way. I was in, enthralled by the whole process. It was amazingly well done. And then you get to the end to where here's the moment of enlightenment. You ready? You know, <clears throat> and all it was was uh, this is it. This is it. There is no enlightenment. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Really? Yeah. And I was like, whoa, he's right. And then it was funny um, because people were like, wait, this isn't it. You can't tell me this isn't it. Uh, so it illustrated their problem that they thought there was an it to be found. And there is no it out there. There's just right now. There. I see. And this is was, a little bit like Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Yeah, that's yeah. all you have. That's all you and have. That's the only thing you control. You can't control. You can't change the past. You can't control the future. You just have right now. In which you can take stands. And that was a big uh, concept. You take the stand that, and then you come to your seminar the next week and you report on how it went. Um, and the idea is living out of a stand, which to me is a goal, which I study, uh, gives you tremendous power. And, of course, you can screw up and you need to start over or reconsider. But living intentionally can make a huge difference because it activates all these non-conscious processes that support us in our intentions. So we need a conscious mind that tells the non-conscious mind, this is what I want, now go get it for me. And then the non-conscious brings you creative insights, and you say, okay, pretty good, let me try that. And so it's this sort of internal dialogue that um, uh, it's how free will works, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, I remember Leonard Milan now, the science writer, and I went to uh, see Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle together on stage wow. at the Shrine Auditorium in L.A. There was like 3,000 people there, and they each paid a couple hundred bucks. Like, whoa, wow. unbelievable. And these were not, uh, I mean, these were pretty well-off people. There were a lot of, like, Lexus and Teslas in the parking mm -hmm. lot. It was like, okay, you know, this, and it's not far from Hollywood. It's like, all right. <laughs> and there was a lot of those kind of people. It's like, all right, they must be getting something out of this, right? The, you know, the power of now and, you know, that those kind of messages really seem to resonate. Yeah. Did you get anything out of it or were you worried you're skeptical? Well, I do. Uh, uh, no, I, well, I am kind of skeptical. I've long been kind of in, in, in confrontation with Deepak, but he and I since became friends. Actually, he invited my wife and I down to a, a week, uh, a four-day weekend at his uh, Chopra Center in Carlsbad, California, Southern California. And it's at this really nice posh resort golf course place, not far from the beach, you know. So it was great. Yeah, I mean, we were just doing yoga and eating great food and tea and meditation and massages. And I was working out every day for a bike ride down the coast and so on. And But at, afterwards, I thought, boy, if if you do all that, you're staying at a five-star resort in Carlsbad, California, on the beach, having a great time. How could you not feel better? Yeah. I mean, you've got to really fuck up to, re to not be getting something out of this. So does it work? Yeah, it works. 
But what do you mean by work? Okay, so what Deepak wants to say is that it works in a scientific sense, not just it works for you, but it doesn't work for me, whatever, that it's a measurable effect. So meditation, for example, mm -hmm. you know, it really does lower uh, stress hormones and blood pressure and these kinds of measurable techniques. And he's done studies showing that, you know, you have like three groups, the non-meditating group, the novice meditating group, the professional meditating group, you know, and that you see the scale up uh, effects on health and measurable um, things like stress hormones and things like that. But also self-control, you know, you just, yeah. you take that away and then, you know, in your regular life, you just meditate one hour every two days or whatever it is, you know, so uh, yeah, I think, I think there's something to that. Yeah. If it's teaching you tools for uh, regulating your emotions, clarifying your intentions and then enacting them, I think it's great. If it's just trying to dazzle you with the star power of the, the people who are get, delivering platitudes, you know, not mm -hmm. so great. Yeah. Deepak is not like that. I mean, a lot of skeptics don't like him. They think he's a con man. He's not. He really cares about people. He really wants, he's a doctor. He wants to help people make a difference. And, you know, there's a lot of woo-woo in there, uh, as I've called it. <laughs> he mm -hmm. doesn't like that, but mm -hmm. okay. Um, you know, maybe this works, maybe it doesn't. It depends on, again, what you mean by work. You know, if somebody tells me, I tried this and my life is better, I really don't want to say, well, no, that's bullshit. If they tell me their life is better, okay, well, then that's good. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, you kind of have to accept the person as the final authority. Uh, even if you can tell that they're de deceived and self-deluded, uh, they're probably not going to want to hear that until maybe just the right moment. But, um, yeah, I lost the train of thought there. But Oh, well, I, was just, I had another thought of uh, some of these stories I repeat on the podcast, so sorry to listeners. But I met Isaac Hayes once, the great uh, singer. And he was the chef on on uh, South Park and so on, big star. Mm -hmm. And at a friend of mine's um, uh, house at Thanksgiving dinner, and there he is sitting right across from me, the great Isaac Hayes. And he's a, he was a Scientologist at the time. This was mm -hmm. in the late '90s, and it was it was you know it it kind of came famous. Oh my God, Isaac Hayes has become a Scientologist. Him and Tom Cruise and John yeah, Travolta. Yeah. Oh my God, it's crazy. So there he is. So I just asked him, you know, what is it that Scientology does for you? Why do you like it? And he said, Well, Michael, I'll tell you. You know, I was a big star. I had tons of money. I had everything you could want. And then I lost it all. You know, sex, drugs, rock, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was down and out and they got me back on my feet. And, you know, now I'm back in, you know, and this is what did it for me. And it's like, I, I don't want to say, yeah, but Scientology is a bunch of bullshit. Don't you know about Xenu, the Galactic War and all that crazy shit? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to say that, right? Because yeah, yeah. the guy just told me it, it, it turned his life around. Well, it apparently gave him the context or the tools that were helpful to literally turn his life around um and he's willing to overlook all the, the kind of bullshit parts of it and those on the outside may not be willing to overlook that um but you know whatever works for the person i think is good let's talk about your tote model t-o-t-e test operate test exit how does that fit into this self-determination theory this is just an old uh, neuroscience and um, control systems idea, which th says the basic action unit is when you set a goal and then you start operating to try to reduce the discrepancy between the current situation and the goal. And so you're trying to approach the goal. And so you test, but then you test again. Am I there yet? No. Okay. Operate some more. Am I there yet? So it's just a, a negative feedback process where we approach a goal. And um, that's obviously things, something that human brains do all the time. It's part of this literature review that we're writing right now. Uh, the more interesting question, which is less well addressed, is how do we decide on the goal in the first place? You know, um, and there's two very different brain states, the one that's trying to decide what to do and the one that's trying to enact the decision after it's been made. And they operate quite differently and I think the free will process operates in that first uh, deliberation phase when we're considering alternatives. Um, and then once we make a decision and we cross the Rubicon to a goal, then the tote activity f starts up where, okay, am I there yet? No. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? So it's a constant feedback loop system like autocatalysis in chemistry uh, and cellular biology. Yeah, that kind of makes sense for the mind. You know, I'm just thinking, since you work uh, one of the pioneers in positive psychology, we've been talking about a lot of these self-help movements, uh, S going back to the 70s, you know, and you and I are about the same age. I remember all that. 
happening. I've been to the uh, Esalon Institute several times up in Big Sur. Oh, my God, what a great place. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a game changer for a lot of people. And you can see why, you know, the environment does matter, right? These, these, these super cool self-help places are always in places like Hawaii and Sedona, Arizona yeah. at the beach somewhere. And, you know, I guess if you had it in the middle of the desert where it was flat and ugly, it just wouldn't have the same effect. The environment doesn't make a difference, but just, uh, you know, so let's look at the bigger picture of psychology. You know, why did it not? come up until the 70s, 80s, and then the official positive psychology movement until the 1990s. That seems pretty late. Why psychology missed all that aspect of human behavior for all those centuries before? Yeah. Well, I would disagree that it missed all that before. Um, there's been you know, Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers. There's been countless theorists and researchers focused on positive. Uh, there's been well-being. Oh, Viktor Frankl. Frankl. Right. There's been well-being research since um, Ed Diener invented that uh, area back around 1980. What happened in the late 1990s was that um, uh, in a little, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but it was a little bit of a marketing thing, in my opinion. In this sort of mainstream research psychology, which doesn't include Maslow and the humanists and Rogers, uh, we've been ignoring this, so we should start to think about it. And I was happy to go along with that, but I didn't think that it was that original of a thing at the time. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. So maybe it's, well, maybe it's a bit of the negativity bias also. We noticed that depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, that kind of the the big heavy hit, violence, aggression, homicide. Why do people, you know, the Stanley Milgram, how come people commit violence against others, shock people, you know, and so on. You know, that was all that that got a lot of press. Right. So what you're telling me is that this other movement was always there. It just didn't stand out as much. It didn't stand out because it wasn't really trying to be rigorously scientific. It wasn't Maslow didn't do experiments with random assignment. You know, Carl Rogers was a clinician who wrote about what worked when he did therapy. And so that's that's really what it was about is importing into mainstream research psychology some of these you know, less considered ideas about how things go right with people instead of how they go wrong with people. Yeah, I do recall there was something of a looking down upon the clinicians in psychology by experimentalists. Like, they're not really doing science. That's just that squishy therapy stuff. Yeah. And I'm trained as a social psychologist, so I am very steeped in that scientific ethos, you know, that you can't really make a claim unless you have experimentally manipulated the DV and you've measured, you've done a manipulation check. And that is the, the gold standard in science. But a lot of psychology, you can't quite approach that way. And maybe you just have to collect data over time and then do sort of correlational analyses of this changes first and then that changes and then that changes. And so I do a lot of that kind of research as well. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this thing up by get, looking at the big picture of happiness, meaningfulness, purposefulness. There's quite a few books about this now. Your last two chapters are on that subject. What do we know scientifically about what makes people happy or fulfilled or whatever yeah. the right words are? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a deep subject. According to self-determination theory, we have psychological needs, and when we get them met, that makes us happy. Uh, these are evolved psychological needs, and they are the desire to uh, feel like the cause and owner of one's behavior, to feel autonomous in what one does, the desire to feel competent in what one does, that one's good at it and one's getting better, and the desire to feel connected to other people in the, in the process. So these are the three uh, main psychological needs, according to self-determination theory, and there's good evidence. I've, I've published uh, some experimental research showing that, yeah, those are all really important. Um, so in one sense, that's all you need to do is just do things that you want to do that you can do well at and be connected to others in the process. That's the simplest formula I mm. pull out of it. It is simple. It's nice. Yeah, I had Mark Schultz on the show. He wrote that book, uh, co-authored that book, uh, The Good Life, part of that Harvard longitudinal study that started in 1938. And it's just amazing how simple it is. Just have some good friends, somebody that loves you, that you love, have a social circle, you know, buddies that you do stuff with. And that's worth, that's better than not smoking. 
<laughs> and and not drinking excessively in terms of longevity and health. That's right. Uh, there's this concept of eudaimonia it goes back to Aristotle, and it's become fashionable in psychology, and it's, even though it's not very well defined. But the basic idea is we don't teach our kids to try to be happy. We teach them to try to be good people, to be, you know, virtuous, to have values. And then we think that happiness will result from that, right? And so this eudaimonic approach says the best way to live is to try to live well according to principles and values that are inclusive and accepting. Uh, and if we try to be that best person we can, um, that will sort of automatically fulfill our needs and make us happy people. But to the extent we're trying to take shortcuts and get straight to the happiness without doing the work that it really takes to get there, uh, it might backfire. And then those shortcuts include things like, uh, you know, trying to get wealthy. Maybe materialism is, can be quite pernicious. Engagement in careers that aren't fulfilling us, but we think we need them because we've got bills to pay. So it all comes back to our choices. You know, we can choose to do the thing that's not working, or we can try to try uh, try something different. And is uh, on Aristotle's virtue ethics and eudaimonia. Is it true that if you act virtuously, even if you don't feel it, at, in time you will come to feel like I really feel good about doing this to help other people. I didn't before, but now I do because I did it. Is that true? I think that can happen because. Uh, Self-determination research shows that people have an in sort of intrinsic need to internalize what they're doing. It, it might start off that you feel like you have to, but then you'll make it a part of yourself. And one example is you ask middle schoolers, why do you clean up your room? Well, Mom makes me. You ask high schoolers, why do you clean up your room? It's because so I know where my stuff is, and so I kind of feel organized in my life. So they've gone through a process of internalizing that that uh, behavior and making it part of themselves. So I think that's um, really critical to do. Right, especially if you have a society based on individual autonomy where the government's not going to control everything and you don't want religion to be too dominant, people need to in inculcate these ideas of hard work and virtuous behavior uh, and not have the little policemen running around making them do stuff. Right. And having role models is hugely important for that, but it's also important not to try to force people to be uh, what you want them to be. They have to want it for themselves. And so that's yeah. the tricky balance of pulling out that little part of them that's not currently in charge and trying to blow on it like a little uh, uh, ember of flame. <laughs> Keep it alive. Is it your sense that this is uh, the self determination theory applies to everybody? It's part of human nature. It's not just a culture bound Western idea. You know, a weird idea. Yeah, that that's the claim, and there's lots of uh, cross cultural evidence supporting the theory. No matter where you look, uh, people are happier and higher functioning when they feel autonomous in what they're doing. You might think, oh, a collectivist culture, they shouldn't care about that, but they do. And so what the culture does is it just puts constraints around individual functioning that can make it harder, you know, to be autonomous, perhaps, or easier. But even in a culture like the U.S., where we have a lot of autonomy, that doesn't solve the problem because we still need to yearn, learn to use it, you know, in a way that's not selfish, Right. So I don't, we don't want to equate autonomy and selfish hedonism or narcissism. They're two very different concepts. Hmm. What do you mean? Then what, what would be a better goal for that? Um, autonomy just means getting to the place where you are owning and being responsible for what you're doing. We, we want to be in that place, except when maybe when we're making excuses uh, but even then, we should get over the excuses and we'll be better off if we accept the consequences of the choices that we're making. Otherwise, we can't learn from them. So let's use money as an example. I, uh, I, I think having money is good because it gives you freedom and autonomy. To, if for nothing else, to not have to worry about whether you're going to make your bills or not yeah. every month, right? You don't have to think about money if you have enough of it. 
I think what you're trying to say is that if that was your only goal, like I'm just trying to get the, as many zeros in my bank account as I can, that then that's the wrong way to go about it. I would say so. And the, uh, the happiness research shows that money is kind of good up to a certain point, and then it stops making things any better in terms of your happiness. So you need to have a certain minimum amount to have security. But if you get to that point and you remain obsessed with getting more, uh, you're probably ignoring a lot of the finer, more eudaimonic uh, aspects of life that would work better to to make you a happier person. <laughs> Kevin Kelly said in the show the last week, you don't want to be a billionaire. I know a lot of billionaires. You don't want to be one. Believe me, it's not worth it. And it just what do you do with all the money? Right, you end up spending all your time trying to figure out how to, you know, uh, how to spend the money, do, do, you know, uh, donate the money, which causes to support and so, just endless. Yeah, um, I recently got kind of a um, largish inheritance, and it's been really interesting to watch how it has changed or affected <laughs> my thinking and my wife and I's thinking because. You know, I didn't used to have that. Now I do. And how how am I going to make it bigger? You know, <laughs> right? Um, do I deserve to even spend this? And it's just a whole new set of problems. Well, I I, I have a solution for you, Ken. Uh, the Skeptic <laughs> Society is a five hundred one c three nonprofit. You could get a tax deductible <laughs> donation. <laughs> well, apparently Bill Gates is you know, he can't give it away fast enough, right? Because he has such good investments that it just keeps growing. Maybe not in recent years because of the stock market crash and all that, but. You know, but that's the idea. You you just make it work for itself, and then you can find lots of different sources. But even that has to be done carefully, right? Which nonprofits are the right ones? You know, that effective altruism and all that stuff. Right, right. Which is interesting, kind of a rational form of making charitable donations. You know, Peter Singer has this, uh, I forget the name of his group. I give to them every year um, because they tell me anyway that the money goes directly to the people that need it, not the the budget and the building and the salaries of mm -hmm. the people running the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be nice if that were true, but uh, I think it's all too tempting for people to start to lose touch with their original goal and start to like their security and their perks. Mm. Yes, of course. Right. <laughs> but the other thing I don't like about this, you know, you don't need money is I, I don't like this idea of, you know, rich people, you know, telling the rest of us, don't you worry your pretty little head about my yacht when I'm out there enjoying my weekends on my yacht. I'm not any happier than you. It's like, I'll take the yacht, please. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember, you don't want to be a billionaire. No, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the joke about the two best days of a boat owner's life is the day he buys the boat and the day he sells the boat. <laughs> right. That's a good one. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I guess it's. I, uh, uh, the other line, you know, I have something that Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whoever doesn't have. What's that? Enough. Mm, that's <laughs> you know, a good one. Yeah, maybe that's what you're you're talking about there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, last big picture look at at this um, purposefulness and meaningfulness is maybe a different concept than happiness. So you know, you guys use this term um subjective well-being does that inco incorporate all of that um not really a subjective well-being is just feeling positive emotions feeling generally satisfied not feeling a lot of negative emotions so the way i look at it that's how you know that you're doing the the right stuff is that you're getting subjective well-being but again you don't want to go for the positive feelings directly because you'll end up shortcutting and and doing things that don't, uh, they aren't honorable. They aren't. They don't have integrity. So really, what you want is to do the things with integrity. Forget about whether it makes you happy, to some extent, and then you'll you'll probably experience happiness as a symptom of that. Right. So you don't want to go for the symptom. You want to go for the real thing, uh, of you know, mon your harmonic function, if you want to. Call it. Yeah. Yeah, but back to your est, there is no it, there's no there, there. It, uh, so would it be that, you know, the meaning of my life, myself, is n not to get somewhere, it's just from day to day to day having a fulfilling life. Yeah. That involves other people and so on, and there's no, there's no, there's no there to get there. I think I agree with that. Um, 
there's no heaven. <laughs> write a song <laughs> yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's just now, and that's all we got, and we might as well enjoy it until there isn't a now anymore. Yeah. Well, the way I say it is, even if there is an afterlife, a hereafter, we don't live in the hereafter. We live in the here and now. Right. So what difference does it make? <laughs> right. Right. You know, and, and if anything, it's worse. If you think this is just a provisional proscenium before the big show in the next life, then you, you'll go back to your belief and determinism. Then what's the point? Why bother e even trying if this doesn't really matter? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of a uh, problem with predestination, right? That it's already de been determined by God whether you're going to heaven or not. So really, why, why you try in that case? Yeah, another thing I was thinking about, uh, just the last thought on this, uh, you know, the real me. You know, events in my life that have happened that were big seem to change, meaning as I get older. Like, you know, X happened and it meant this thing when it happened, and then 10 years later it meant something else, and now 50 years later it means something else entirely different. You know, my parents were divorced when I was very young. I had to split time between my parents' house and every other weekend with my dad and all that stuff. And sometimes I look back, oh, that was just terrible. You know, I wish I had one home and I wish my parents had stayed married, but I'm not sure I actually think that. <laughs> I think maybe I'm making up a story now about that. <laughs> and maybe at the time it was fine because actually most of the time I think it was fine. So I don't really know what the truth is. Yeah. It's very hard to tell. <laughs> that's why we have science, right? And skepticism. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Ken, that's great. Uh, enjoyed the book again. Freely determine what the new psychology of the self tells us about how to live. He solves the free will determinism problem, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> to the extent that it can be, I think it's just so wrapped up in these words and what they mean. But I do like the way you come at it from a practical point of view applying these principles to your own life. And there, there it does make a difference. Yeah. And there's been too much on the topic from the philosophers and the neuroscientists. And I just wanted to bring a personality perspective to the question. Yeah. And I think, um, I hope that it's a useful perspective. Oh, totally. I got so much out of the book. All right. That's great. Thank you.